This podcast is sponsored by WorthPoint. Find out what your antiques are worth at worthpoint.com. I'm with repeat guest Richard Wright in Chicago. How are you, Richard? Hello, doing fine. Good to talk to you again. Today we're going to talk about Italian glass as I'm preparing for um, an upcoming Italian glass auction. Um, The second one that I have held featuring a single owner sale, one person's collection of uh, Italian glass. Always nice to have a single owner sale no matter what it is. That's true. (laughs) You're certainly writing a lot less checks afterwards. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I have uh, handled in the past when I was in California some you know, more or less contemporary Italian makers that seem to be very, very collectible. And uh, can you talk about what's in this collection in particular? Sure. I mean, this collection really spans the century. I mean, broadly speaking, there is a a true renaissance in Murano glass, Italian glass, in the 20th century, Um, sort of peaking in the in the in the immediate post-war period but beginning really at the beginning of the century and when i say a renaissance it's sort of a reimagining and reinvigorating of the ancient uh, industry that, that was always based on the island of murano beginning i you know by the 1600s 1500s um, i actually glass. think it was earlier than that I, I was reading recently a little bit about uh, it was moved from Venice out to Murano because they were afraid of fires. I think it was in the 1200s, but I'm not positive. Yeah, so that yeah, that, I'm not not good on the old stuff, but yes, um, that would make sense. I mean, like so, an ancient tradition going on on that island. You have that sort of uh, you know embedded industry that is is really brought to life again in the 20th century with through the work of you know the, a, a new generation of artists and designers. Um, that start to bring a level of design to the glass that had just been kind of stuck in a historical mode for many centuries. Mm. And it really flowers, and, and it's, a, it's sort of a perfect story of, you know, design and industry coming together and sort of the, the idea of craft, which, of course, existed there, and then the, the power of design and the artist when it is melded with craft that can make, you know, such powerful decorative art. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of these are generational, you know, family just carries on and carries on. And what is the focus of the collection that you have coming up, the family name? Uh, and the focus of this collection is Barovier. Um, Barovier is one of those um, ancient families. Um, I don't know the full history, to be honest, but the 20th century, you know, the, 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 certainly the, the Barovier glass blowing works existed in the 19th century, and it's in the 20th century um, that it that it really starts to flower and become one of the main, you know, the best producing the best glass in Murano, um, along with Vinini. Mm -hmm. And and how many pieces are coming up in this collection? So it's a big collection. We have 230 pieces in the auction. Yeah. Um, the low estimate is just a, just a little bit over $1 million. Um, wow. You know, the, the, the pieces range from $1,000 to $40,000 is the low estimates. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think it, it is – the collection is really interesting because I think that it encompasses the breadth of the century. You know, it covers the entire century. I think it covers the breadth of what you can collect in terms of some very expensive rarities and some more common items and, you know, hits along all the major manufacturers. But the person had a particular passion for the work of Barovier, one designer in particular, Air Cole Barovier, who was the design director, son of, uh, you know, one of, uh, you know, his father, you know, so generational business of glass blowers. And Air Cole Barovier takes over in the early teens, um, and or teens or twenties, and and really runs the show and designs the glass through the nineteen seventies. So it's really an amazing, uh, wow. it's an amazing story and a great sort of run. That's a long span. It's a long span, right? Now, how did the collector? Uh, is it a gentleman or a woman? It is. It is a gentleman. Yes. And, and how did this collector begin his collecting and and have such a passion for this type of glass? The full story is that, I, to be honest, I have not met the collector. Um, it is, it is the, the collection is being brought to us through his primary dealer. I see. So it's a Parisian collection. Mm-hmm. 
there is a well-known uh, dealer in in Paris um, named Arnaud who runs uh, Galerie Plaisance uh, and has dealt in Italian glass for many many years. He worked very closely with this collector and built the collection. Um, and the collector now, for life reasons, has decided to sell. Entrusted Arnaud to find the best you know venue to to have the sale and then we won the competition to to produce the auction so the so we've dealt exclusively with Arno and the pieces you know now are in Chicago but um, we've we've not met the principal I see. Arno has a particular passion for Barovier um, and you know I think that 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 clearly was was you know translated to his collector um so the 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 vast majority of the barovier works do come from arnaud um and it's an interesting field you know the italian glass as you study the collecting field it's it's a pretty small field and Mm -hmm. you know to to have provenance um attached to some of these important pieces adds a lot of value now Mm -hmm. um because there are we can discuss later i mean there, there there are copies of these works and there are reissues and there are a lot of a lot of very specific things to learn about this collecting field it's it's not something to just um dabble in per se um it's you really do need to to acquire some expertise or to buy from you know the top dealers and top auction houses that can guarantee the work and have expertise to 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 describe the pieces correctly so this person bought a, you know, built a very good collection because he worked with a very few number of the top dealers. And, you know, there were hardly any pieces in the collection once it was shipped here that we took out. A couple things had minor damage and had to be removed. But, you know, um, it's fantastic that there were no fakes in the collection. Mm. It is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real issue in the Italian glass world. Now, if you took, say, uh, let's just say, a typical a vase that you're talking about, and it was worth, say, $1,500, and then you had a reissue, what would the value of a reissue? Now, when you say a reissue, you're not talking about a fake. You're talking about reissued from the family, a similar des- design? Yes. I mean, there. so uh, Vanini and Barovier, um have uh Vanini has reissued pieces and continues to make or started to make some of their classic designs again mm-hmm. um they they mark them differently and there's a way to differentiate um between them yeah okay sorry but um but the value is you know it's probably worth a tenth of of the real thing or the original thing um so you know that that's the same you know barovier there's it it can be a little tricky because there are pieces that are reissued much later those are probably worth you know a tenth then wow. there are pieces that are made you know 10 years later or 20 years later and they may be worth 30% less mm-hmm. um then there are pieces that are made you know one thing with the early glass is the 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 top blowers the the the, the artisans that actually make the glass would sometimes change uh the the houses that they were working for mm-hmm. and they would take their expertise with them and in some cases the design and in some cases the designer would switch to to a, a competing house this is true of somebody like Martin Nuzzi um so you have you have uh glass from the 30s that can be very valuable and it can be very hard to pinpoint exactly when it was made and there's a lot of value attached to the first iteration of that design and it might be made 15 years later and it might be blown by the exact same blower but it's for a different company it's probably a different color glass different quality and the price is less so mm. it's there's there's a lot to learn about it, but you know, like any collecting field, that's sort of what makes it exciting. It's amazing when um, I, I'm sure you've been to Murano, and I, I've been there myself. You know, to watch them work is really quite amazing, and just the interaction they have with each other. <laughs> they're kind of a lot of alpha males uh, 
in there. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's amazing to watch glass being blown. And it's, really, it's, it, yeah. when you look at the sophistication and the delicateness of the designs, and then you also watch this kind of brute strength that is required, mm-hmm. especially to blow some of the bigger pieces where the, the glass is heavy, you know, it's, a, in, and there, you know, you have pipes and you have fire and you have weight. And then you are ultimately dealing with, you know, very specific, very fragile, obviously, uh, design so it's it's a it's a great inherent tension in the making of it yes and and do you know how young some of these people start out as apprentices and there you know i think i do think that that people start you know in, in their in their late teens i mean i think that you know there's i i can't speak with authority to this, but I, you know, I know historically, if your family was in the glass blowing family, you would, of course, you know, you'd be exposed to it from your childhood. When would you build up and start blowing? You know, mm-hmm. that I would imagine in your teens, um, certainly by your twenties. You know, not all of the top designers, and in fact, actually relatively few of the top designers actually blew their own glass. Um, really. So, you know, the, the, the blowing does get separated from the design work. I think you have to, you have to have a real, um, you know, you have, to, you have to understand the process of it. But, you know, I think that the, the visual talent doesn't always align with the, you know, the, 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 the artisan talent. Now, going back to what we were talking about earlier, the... Um, I heard you say the word fakes, and I always bring that up in these podcasts. And um, besides someone going to your auction and being assured that they're going to get, you know, an original piece, which is if someone's thinking of collecting, I would highly recommend that. Uh, but first of all, before I forget, what's the actual date of that auction? It's on Saturday, June 8th. Okay. Say someone misses the auction. This podcast will be up for a while. Um, someone misses that auction, and they want to be careful would you suggest that they only purchase pieces from a dealer at that point? Yes. I mean, I think that if you are interested in collecting Italian glass, you need to build up your level of expertise. Really, the best way to do that is to build a relationship with one of the top dealers. Um, you know, it's a very specialized field. I've dealt Italian glass for about 20 years myself. I hire specialists, I hire expertise in this field Mm -hmm. because I don't know it as intimately as you need to know it. Um, You know, so you need to buy from the absolute top reputable dealers, um, you know, or the top reputable auction houses until you have the expertise to differentiate between the fakes. The fakes that are made today and, and, you know, uh, to be honest, probably 90% of the expensive works are faked, you know, wow. yep. not, not reproduced out and out faked mm-hmm. with fake signatures and, yep. and, and everything. Um, you, so you really, you, you have to know what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's not unlike buying Tiffany glass, you right. know, mm-hmm. you'd be a fool to just dabble in Tiffany glass and start buying lamps. You would, you would be well served to pay more and buy from the top dealers until you've handled enough pieces yourself. And then if you want to go out and look for a bargain, you can tell the difference. And, and mm. you know, that's, that's all well and good. Um, eBay, there's fakes on there every single day. Sure. Uh, we get offered glass, you know, all the time. Oh, you know, more than half of it is fake. Um, so, you know, you learn by handling you, a couple of things. Let me back up to say, it's an incredibly well-documented period. So the number of reference books now on Murano Glass is unbelievable. I mean, we have a shelf full, um, and we don't have all of them. So you can – there's a lot to learn. Um, so you can start buying the books and learning the history. I tell anybody if you're going to focus, you know, if, if you like Italian glass, start by focusing. So do you cho- choose a factory? You know, um, my personal favorite, if I had to choose, would be Vanini. I just, uh, I, I like Vanini. I find it the easiest to differentiate the, the, the real material from the fakes. It's 90 five percent of the time signed um and while there are fake pieces with fake signatures once you've handled enough of it you can you can tell pretty quickly Mm -hmm. um great literature 
So everything kind of makes sense there for Vanini. But anyway, I, you know, I would start by start small and then build up your expertise. Go out and handle as much work as you can. I mean, you know, if anyone hears this in time, you know, certainly uh, auction houses, the public preview is free and you can actually pick up the pieces <laughs> carefully mm-hmm. um, and you get to see them. And, and for anybody with an interest, it's a great opportunity to see a couple of hundred pieces that, you know, the man collected for two decades. So so you know the 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 what you can learn by handling it is invaluable. You know we get pieces offered to us, and we don't know with some some of the rare pieces you don't know for sure until you actually handle the piece because there's a quality. Some pieces are supposed to be really light. Some of them have a certain you know iridescent finish some of it the way the pontal is finished there's just there's qualities about them as you handle them that you remember and that you learn and and it's it's the quality of touch in italian glass i can't overstate it it really you know we go to a lot of work to produce a beautiful catalog and take great images but when you see the work in person and touch it 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 is it is different right um i just recall from a few pieces that i've handled in the past, knowing that they sold for quite a bit of money, I'm sure they were most likely right, I would think. <laughs> if, if you've handled, I think you've handled some pieces in the past, one thing to know, many or most of the great uh, Italian glass was exported to America, um, you know, especially the, the uh, post-war material, which is, you know, some of the most visual, most colorful and, and most valuable. Um, you know, Italy was rebuilding their country. Um, America was, you know, led the world in, you know, the economy was expanding and we were, we had all the money. Um, and we have a very special tie to, you know, the Italian culture here in America. So great pieces are, you know, absolutely all over America. And that's what's great about it. It was pretty widely distributed. So is that one of the reasons why the collection came over here to the U.S. is because there's more of it over here and probably more collectors? Yeah, I think that the top market, the top people buying are Americans. Um, There's a very good market for this glass in Italy, but, you know, if you know anything about (laughs) doing business in Italy, uh, trying to ship this and sell this in Italy and deal with uh, taxes and customs and and, and all of that is uh, kind of tricky. So, um, you know, America makes a lot of sense. We'll sell a lot of it here. We will sell sell some of it back to Italy. Um, And then it goes, it goes all over the world. I mean, there are, you know, there, there are collectors in, in, in Japan, um, you know, certainly in other countries in Europe. Um, so it's, it's a widely, it's a wide field. So can you more or less describe in the vintage that you're going to be selling what the glass is like? Sure. So, you know, Italian glass is by and large, I mean, it's all blown, so it's all blown glass, but it tends to be not overly decorated. Um, so we're selling everything from pieces that are very austere, that are simple f- forms, sort of classical forms, done in one color, um, where it's all about the thinness of the glass and the proportion of the design and sort of the beauty of the execution. Um, and, and work like that can be can, uh, some of the most famous work uh, in that mode is by Carlo Scarpa that does a um, uh, famous architect and design designer in Italy who does very understated, refined, just, you know, uh, almost classical pieces. Um, You know, Italian or Murano glass from the post-war is all about color, Um, typically transparent color, um, you know, very bright spirals of of bright poppy colors, patches of colors, um, and there's sort of an exuberance to the design that is that is immediate. Um, But it's not it's not done in any it's not it's very little of the sort of wheel carved cameo glass technique, almost none of that. Very some of these things have wheel carved surfaces just to add to a textural 
feel. Very, very rarely do they carve in a decoration or a design. Um, very little of the top glass has a lot of extraneous decoration, a lot of filigree handles or, you know, those sort of things. Um, and when they do, they're handled with a real restraint. So it's, um, but I think you can look through the, 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 the sale and look through the 20th century of Murano and you, you'll see, you know, you'll see things that are over the top, like just a riot of color and things that are very, you know, just a palest blue, you know, urn shaped vase. So it's, it, it, it's hard to sum up and just, there's not one visual trope that sort of identifies Italian glass. Can you describe what the expensive piece you said you had a piece all the way up to the low estimate of forty thousand? What is that like? So the piece that's forty thousand dollars is a Barovier piece. It's from nineteen twenty nine. It's a very rare technique called Primavera, and it's Primavera glass is a clear glass that has a lattice work of white veins running through it, almost as if it was a morning frost on a you know on a on a, on a fall morning. Um, this glass was produced very early on, so in the in the late twenties, and it's produced for a very short period of time, and nobody's been able to reproduce it. So it, it, Barovier discovers it sort of by accident. It's a series of chemical, you know, things that they mix with the glass. And he produces this acclaimed series of glass um, in, in this, you know, it, it, a lot of the forms are sort of fantastically classical. So we're selling a lidded urn shape with little tiny handles that are applied in a blue, in a blue uh, glass. Um, the body of this lidded urn is this primavera glass, so sort of a translucent spider webby glass. And that's $40,000. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's built by, you know, the, the, the price is driven by the rarity in the market and the, the fact that there's, you know, the collectors that focus just on that. They just want Primavera glass and it's very hard to find. Similarly, you know, 30 years later, we have a piece by Carlo Scarpa um, for Vanini and it's, it's a penalate is the technique, um, which means painted like paint strokes, uh, brush strokes. And the, it's just a simple ball shaped vase and the exterior of it looks like flashes of color have been applied just with a brush. Um, it's an extremely rare technique, a similar piece sold for over $100,000. We have one, it's estimated twenty to $30,000, um, you know, but it's one of those sort of standout lots in the sale. Now, someone can actually bid at this auction you have coming up online, right? Yes, um, it's all online. You can bid live during the auction um, uh, online. You can bid, you know, by phone. You can bid by absentee. And, of course, we don't mind if you come in person and, and raise a paddle. It's always fun. Are these pieces actually up right now? This is uh, May um, 10th or so. This podcast is going live. Are these pieces actually on the website now? They are. The full catalog is on the website now. Um, public preview will open in two weeks, um, and we'll have, we're setting up a special room um, just dedicated to the glass. So you can go in. None of it will be in uh, showcases, which I think is be kind of neat. So it'll all be out on pedestals and tables, mm -hmm. and you'll be able to, you know, if, <laughs> if you're careful, handle it. Um, we'll have somebody there, of course, to help, um, you, know, uh, you know, to show you and, and talk to you about the pieces. You don't have any earthquakes in Chicago, right? We have no earthquakes in Chicago, so we're safe there. Okay, that's good. Well, Richard, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's always fun. And uh, we'll be talking next time. We'll try to figure out something else to talk about. Good Great. luck with your auction coming up. That is yeah, June 8th, Saturday. And your website is? Right20.com. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. This podcast is sponsored by WorthPoint. Find out what your antiques are worth at worthpoint.com.